Hey folks, Joe Valley here. Thanks for joining me for another episode of the Quiet Life Podcast. Today, I'm talking to Fernando Campos from Marketplace Ops. Fernando's a pretty special guy. Over the last seven years, he's uh, scaled to selling over $150 million on Amazon. Um, he's got a total of 75 full-time remote employees. Um, and he, in this interview, we talk about a number of things. First about how do you sell $150 million on Amazon? What are the top three to five things that people must do in order to you know, uh, get traction and move ahead? And then we touched on some of the key features inside of Seller Central that are there to help you that some people don't even know are there and don't necessarily use. And then we talked again in general about the, the key things to look for in a remote worker and how to treat them well and how to expand to make sure that they're going to stick around for the long term and help you grow your business. It's all fascinating stuff. Fernando's a really smart guy. He uh, gives away a lot of great information here on the podcast. Before we jump there, I want to sh- give a shout out to The Exitpreneur's Playbook. Yes, folks, you hear me talking about it more these days than ever before. We want to give away 10,000 digital copies of the Exitpreneur's Playbook in the next 12 months. If you don't have your copy yet or your friends in your Facebook group or your mastermind don't have a copy yet, please go to exitpreneur.io forward slash QL pod and you'll be able to uh, download a free digital version of the Exitpreneur's Playbook. Spread the word, share that URL wherever you can, please. All right, here we go. Let's go uh, talk to Fernando Campos. Here we go. Fernando, welcome to the Quiet Life Podcast. How are you, man? I'm good. Thanks so so much for having me, Joe. My pleasure. We've known each other quite a while, and I could sort of give a background on yourself to the audience because uh, we've been talking since 2016 or 17, and you're also a a, a former Quiet Light client. You sold the business through... uh, Quite like using uh, Chris Guthrie. But rather than me do that, why don't you give the audience a little bit of background on who you are, what you've been up to, that type of thing? Yeah, um, thanks so much, Joe. Uh, so, yeah, my name is uh, Fernando Campos. I've been selling on Amazon since 2014. Um, since then, till now, we've sold about 150 million on the platform between uh, our own brands and then uh, a lot of our clients. So, I'm one of the partners in Marketplace Ops, and what we do currently is we help a lot of like fast-growing uh, consumer brands scale on the platform. And um, yeah, I mean, we, we've done everything in this space. Um, but yeah, we have a now a, team, a global team of about 75 people that are all just like hyper-specialized in everything Amazon. I, I love how casually you say, yeah, you know, we've, we've sold about 150 million since 2014 or 15. That's a lot of money, man. That's 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 a pretty <laughs> impressive number. So good for you. Um, I know that you've been uh, an exitpreneur, if you will. You've sold your mm-hmm. business, and now you're you've you've taken your experience and you've built this uh, agency called Marketplace Ops. But but let's we're going to bounce around here a bit. What with your experience in selling now in 2022 versus 2014 and 15, you've seen a lot of changes on Amazon, on Facebook, on all the algorithm updates and everything. Where do you see e-commerce in general and Amazon specifically going in the next, let's just say two to five years, because the next two years might be a recession, five years out. What's, what's, what's different now versus what you think is going to happen in the future? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, yeah, I mean, I think things are just changing at a at a faster, faster rate. Um, you know, in the past, you could get away with kind of these like me too products, like just a normal like private label item, you know, sub two dollar cogs, and you know, list it on Amazon, get a few reviews, and it would do really well. I think now sellers are forced to be more disciplined uh, in a variety of ways. One, in terms of like their product quality and product selection, really just. Di- um, having more differentiating uh, offers versus just like, you know, slapping a label and then putting it up. I think it also forces uh, brand owners to, to really start thinking more about the, the customer journey, like what, um, what the brand identity is, like what does it actually like represent? Um, and, I, and I think it's going to increasingly uh, over time require brand owners to actually be omni-channel 
I think in the past you could just build this like Amazon native brand. I mean, you still can for sure today uh, if you have like the right team and like the right understanding of how like, skill set of being able to execute. But I think uh, like, as you're kind of looking at the yeah three to five year horizon, I, I do think that it's just going to require um, yeah more like um, social media following, like paid ads, like email marketing, things that you didn't necessarily have to do before building an Amazon native brand, but I think will be pretty much a requirement as you kind of look at the later half of that timeline. So it's, it's harder to launch a brand on Amazon, um, but those that do it and are successful, it sounds like they're building a more stable business because of uh, doing a better job with building a, a real brand and then going omni-channel and driving traffic to it through social media, things of that nature. Does that make it, by the way, easier to launch new products and new SKUs when you've got other channels to launch to, like social media, giving a new uh, you know, a product SKU to your audience to take a look at with the Amazon link? Is that making it easier totally. to launch? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, if you have a lot of like branded search, like if you're doing a lot of paid ads, um, or let's say like a lot of like influence or marketing, it can absolutely like really, really help um, your ranking and indexation on Amazon. Um, you know, what, like a lot of this kind of reports that I've seen is that for every dollar of ad spend, like on paid social, let's say like Facebook or Google ad, um, you'll see about a 25% lift of like dollar, um, you know, so 25 cents in sales for every dollar that you spend on ads on the Amazon platform, even if you were directing people to Shopify, just because so many consumers are used to purchasing um, on, on, on Amazon. Amazon. And yeah, like, yeah, I do the same. I do the same. If I see a product on somebody's website, the first thing I'll do is, can I just buy that on Amazon? I know it'll get here tomorrow if I do that. Or I have a fulfillment center about 30 minutes from where I live, Fernando. So it's often here the same day. Um, so wow. I'm, the, I'm that guy that's going to go ahead and see if I can <laughs> just get it on Amazon. It's also easier to return as well. Totally. So that's called the halo effect, right? So if you're advertising on a different platforms, um, you're going to get a lift you know, on Amazon simply because guys like me are going to go ahead and, and shop over on Amazon. So it makes sense to, even, even if you're just breaking even on Facebook, you're probably, you know, that's, that's a lofty goal, right? It's an acceptable goal, I would think, because you're going to mm -hmm. get, you know, a 25% a lift over there on Amazon. Totally. And especially with everything changing kind of with buy with prime right now, since they just did the official like release recently, um, I think it's just going to become even more intertwined between uh, having Amazon and like your direct Shopify. I've always been a, a prime member. What is, what is this new release of buy with prime? What is that about? Yeah. Good question. So, you know, sometimes you're on like on a, on a normal like e-commerce site. So not on Amazon. And then you see this little like button yeah. like with Amazon pay. And so before that was just uh, basically, yeah, I guess Amazon's, uh, payment like it's so it's basically their payment gateway allowing you to like uh use your address and credit card that's saved your amazon prime account but now uh with buy with prime it's really cool uh where they're they're adding in the fulfillment functionality to that payment gateway so right. now it'll actually ship from fba you still have like to your point like the return uh functionality and so basically what they're really saying is now you're gonna have like pretty much the the entire FBA experience in terms of like the payments and the fulfillment on, on a, any random like Shopify website, if they, they're a buy with prime seller. Right. And I think that that app only works on Amazon and WooCommerce at this point. Is, is that right? Or are you not sure? No, I'm pretty sure it's actually on Shopify now too. I'm sorry. What did I say? Uh, yeah. I meant Shopify is the primary one. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. WooCommerce as well. I, I don't think it would work for somebody that's got a WordPress site or something like that, as far as, I, Probably, far as, yeah. far as I've been told. Yeah. Okay. So Omnichannel, yeah, I agree that uh, shop with Prime or buy with Prime button would make a whole lot of sense for folks. Did you do that for any of your brands that you ran and operated? Um, I guess you're still running one, right? You launched a supplement business in 20, just, just earlier this year, right? Uh, we launched it in, we launched a few in 2020, uh, but buy with prime is just, uh, just like released like publicly, yeah. I think maybe yesterday actually. Um, but yeah, so it, it's a brand, brand new like program. Um, I think there was a few, like a uh, few brands in like kind of the beta, um, 
but yeah, we have we haven't tested it yet on Shopify. All right. Yesterday would be a month or so, guys, because this isn't going to air for a month or so. So um, Bios oh, Prime right. is out there as an option for you to take a look at. Um, very cool. Very cool. Um, when you decided to exit your own business, uh, I remember you reaching out and we chatted with together and then Chris Guthrie took the lead on that. What, what was the motivation for exiting that business? How long had you operated it and why did you want to move on? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, at, at the time, we were we were really excited about the supplements brand, and so we we thought that it would be a better situation. Like we we had, we'd grown the brands a lot, but we wanted to really focus on what we were doing in supplements, and so we thought it made sense to sell sell off the brands, um, take some cash off the table, and then be able to redeploy some of the the um, the delta in terms of um into those supplement brands to, to scale it a lot faster um and, and so it, yeah i mean oh good and it, is that that supplement brand is it primarily an amazon brand currently yeah but yeah we're starting to move it more into direct to consumer but yeah right now a huge majority of revenue is still amazon our bread and butter for sure so when you're talking to marketplace op clients um are mm-hmm. you are you demonstrating your supplement brand and things of that nature and showing results in terms of testing that you've done? Is it kind of a, a guinea pig to test new things along with, you know, building your own brand? Totally. Yeah. It's a great question. So, I, I mean, we think of it as kind of a flywheel of knowledge like around Amazon. So naturally we'll test strategies that we come up with on our own, on our brands, with our clients. Sometimes, um, you know, a client might have, a, you know, an interesting idea or, Maybe they have like a crazy budget because they're venture backed and they're like, hey, you know, we need, we want to spend 75 grand on each launch, which, you know, most Amazon sellers would never do. And so it kind of challenges our team and us to, to think more creatively about like, okay, well, how can we use this and how can we, um, how can we think bigger? And so, um, yeah, I, I would say like the, the knowledge is kind of a flywheel in terms of like, yeah, things that we're, we're testing on our own brands, obviously in a, in a way more competitive category like supplements. And then we're applying a lot of those same tactics that we're using in, in various categories where our clients um, compete. Okay. Let's talk just basic tips, you know, to the audience, because again, you've sold uh, $150 million worth of products on Amazon. What are what are like the top five things that somebody must do at a minimum to succeed on Amazon? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, okay, so I think the first one definitely is is product differentiation. I think you know, and it really just thinking about like searching you know your main keywords, like the unbranded keywords on Amazon and. The, the reason that you're looking for unbranded keywords is like, you know, you're looking for um, what are like going back to, uh, to supplements, you're looking for like uh, turmeric capsules, right? And so you don't have a specific brand in mind. And the reason that's important is that 78% of search on Amazon is unbranded. And so, yeah, actually, uh, yeah I'll, I'll use that actually as my first like tip. Is, is really thinking about like, what are the unbranded keywords that you're gonna be really relevant for and ensuring that there's there's volume there. You can use a bunch of different tools out there um, to kind of quantify that volume and brand analytics that Amazon uh, released last year is also really helpful. But just making sure that there's a, a good amount of like depth in terms of keywords, in terms of the actual volume and, and breadth as well. So that there's it's not just like three keywords. Is that, um, is that, is that, you you do that before you decide what product category you're going to go into or you use those keywords in the seller account to help get your rankings up yeah good question so yeah if if we're if we're evaluating client to take on um that maybe hasn't sold on amazon before but maybe they're doing really well on direct to consumer we will absolutely look at those keywords before taking them on and determine like, it, it, does this make sense? Like, for instance, um, you know, we got pitched this brand, a really cool brand. They're doing like a mouth spray with adaptogens. Um, and so kind of like, yeah, I guess like a breath mint kind of spray. And 
what I what, it's a really cool, very like innovative product. Yeah, truly people like very people very few people are looking for mouse spray and really no one's looking for mouse spray specifically with adaptogens. And so because that market is so small on an Am on Amazon, it's just gonna be hard to break even and to really find like new to new to brand or new to, like new customers. And so it's just not the best fit. A lot of people kind of back into those numbers by using like a helium 10 to look at revenue. But uh, yeah, for us, like, yeah, we're looking for those kind of unbranded keywords because and that you're really relevant for so that we can determine like, okay, yeah, we can get you to rank and then therefore um, you'll, you'll drive sales because you have a, a good offering. And so that kind of moves into like, I guess um, the second tip is just having a really differentiated offering and, and whether that's like you're kidding it with like another accessory that makes sense, you're changing up the product a little bit so that it's a little bit better, a little bit more useful, a little bit more durable, um, even like simple ways of differentiating. Like if everybody else is selling a one pack, but it makes sense to, you're going to buy multiple. So putting it into like a two pack or a three pack, um, and then, you know, providing a slight discount to the customer for doing that. Those are all like great, easy ways of like differentiating. But is yeah, just really, really important because I think, you know, there's diminishing returns of having like the 80th, whatever, like barbecue girl gloves on Amazon, right? You're not going to show up on the front page, especially if everybody else has, you know, 10,000 reviews. Um, you're not giving the customer any incentive um, to actually purchase yours. Um that makes sense on I number was, two. Can can we go back to number one? Oh yeah. How, how do yeah. you how do you determine uh, if there's uh, enough generic keyword search available to make it a big enough product? What tools do you use? How do you look at that? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so yeah, there's a, there are a bunch of different tools. Ecom Analytics is awesome. Helium Ten is awesome. Brand Analytics, and so we'll we'll look at all of those tools uh for, for different reasons okay um but yeah i i i, I love all those and the, uh, yeah they're in different price ranges brand analytics is free as long as your brand registry and then um and then helium 10 every like basically everybody has them so yeah it's also very 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 helpful in terms of estimating monthly volume the way that we're looking at it is yeah so like let's let's just say like going back to um like let's say the, the tumor category. So if you're saying tumor supplement, like you're you're pretty relevant, right? But that doesn't necessarily distinguish whether it's a liquid, capsules, powder, like it, it could be a variety of things. So you, you should, in theory, like weight that a little bit lower uh, in terms of like, you're not gonna be able to capture everything, right? And again, it's a, it's a really competitive category. So you know that you're going against competitors with tens of thousands of reviews. Um, but then if, you, if you're trying to sell, like, let's say a liquid, a turmeric liquid, and then you're looking at the turmeric liquid keyword, then you're really, really relevant for that, for that specific keyword. And so you can add weights if you want to, but you're basically kind of trying to, trying to figure out what is, you know, like similar to like a, um, like a starter, it's like, what is like the addressable market, the total addressable market of this, um, this category that I'm going into? And so that's kind of how we're thinking about it. And then it's like, okay, well, turmeric also has like anti-inflammatory properties as well. So like, what are the uh, what are the keywords in there? Do we like what other ingredients are that we're going to be competing with? Do we want to add that to the total addressable market? But and then so the idea is that we're um, we're kind of evaluating like, okay, how how sophisticated is the competition here? How can we really like? Yeah, differentiate this offer and how many different keywords are going to be highly relevant for that Amazon's going to want it to display this product there. Um, and then that I think is kind of what, how we're looking at it. And then we're, if we're evaluating that against the revenue that the top sellers are to, to make sure that it kind of hits the revenue thresholds that we're going after. Okay. Okay. Thanks. I appreciate going back to number one. Number two was differentiating the packaging, onesies, twosies, threesies, something different than what the competition is offering. I'm gonna guess number three is product images and quality of photos and things of that nature, but I could be dead wrong. What would number three be in your opinion? Uh, 
Yeah, it's a good question. I would say it's like it's a version of that, but I would say number three for me would be like visualizing your product in the search result page. And then, so it, it's tied to the main images, like you're saying, but it's like, what will my product look like against everybody else? And then, so if it's like a two pack and everyone else is selling a one pack, it's clearly, clearly different, right? But if let's say you're, again, going back to the barbecue grill gloves and it's like, okay, I'm um, selling another red pair. Everybody, like everybody here is either red or black or orange. Then like, it's not really that differentiated and it's going to be hard to really uh, determine, like to establish like quality differences or anything else. And so what we're kind of just constantly thinking about is like, okay, especially with things moving more towards mobile, you have this like little square to display, to get people to click your product over everybody else's. And like, what can we do to the product even before we place the order, but to like really make sure that like the merchandising and, and just how we're going to display that main image is going to make it so much clearer without reading the title that this product is better than everyone else that's like an incumbent incumbent competitor it's you know as you're talking i'm looking at amazon i looked up uh, turmeric and the images are pretty pretty solid most of them are pretty good but there's a few darker labels where the word turmeric doesn't stand out and the capsules can't be seen and things of that nature um and people are doing what you're talking about uh, you know a bottle and then the box that it would come in and then a, a, a two two pack, two bottle option, three bottle option, things of that nature. Um, totally. Wh- you know, so the images are really important. All of these guys on that first image, they're just showing a product shot, which is, I suppose, what's necessary. Um, s- second thing to look at from a consumer standpoint is, of course, the reviews, but you can't control that when you're first starting out. Exactly. So how do you get you traction it. against, I mean, the top, the top result for turmeric has, oh, look at this, uh, Schwartz bio has 77,504 reviews. How, mm-hmm. do you, how do you make the decision? I'm going to go into that category and compete with somebody like that. And then how do you get the reviews? How do you get traction? How do you get going and build that? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. I mean, yeah, to your point is that you need to really come up with something that's very, very like different. Um, yeah. And so for that specific category, what we did was we added in other specific keywords that also had the same benefits as turmeric, um, which is like, you know, again, like anti-inflammatory like benefit. And so we added garlic, uh, we added bioprint for, uh, for absorption. We added other things. Yeah. That, yeah, basically would make it very differentiated and a better offer than what everyone else is offering we added more milligrams and and we really like highlight that like really clearly in the in in the main image and on the label of the supplement and so then when you're kind of scrolling through like you just see like a very differentiated offer you you can see it probably there um but yeah i think that's a lot of what we do i think what yeah if if you look at other examples um thrasio did a really great job with like the brand angry orange uh, where like they're kind of in the pet deodorant spray space. And I think a lot of them, I forget, they were probably like green, like green bottles before, but, and then like theirs is like this, like really aggressive, bright orange product, right? It's almost like a neon sign in the main image. And mm-hmm. it just really calls, um, calls your attention. And so I think things like that are really what help differentiate um, a product. And then you can go into a more, saturated niche but with like a better offer and and really making it clear to the customer why this this offer is different let me ask you a question why would like that 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 product uh from bio schwartz seventy seven thousand reviews it's actually a sponsored ad but they've got mm-hmm. seventy seven thousand five hundred and four reviews with that many reviews and all i did i just simply did a search for turmeric and mm-hmm. they're they're not on page one for uh, the the organic searches. Actually, they are. They're on the very bottom. 
with, mm-hmm. with that many reviews, what, what would it take to get them up to number one? You know, to the to, or to, oh. the, to the first row of results. I mean, that many reviews to me seems like it would be, a, you know, a catalyst to getting it up to the first row of results below below sponsored ads. Totally. Um, yeah, you know, honestly, it just really depends on the keyword, the offer, like the price point. I mean, like specifically for Bio Schwartz. I mean, they're. Um, I mean, they're one of the leading brands on Amazon in the supplement space. I, I would say. Uh, it would probably be pretty easy. I'm surprised that they're not ranked uh, a little bit higher, to be honest. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, it could be like, it could be pricing, it could be indexation, it could be a, 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 a million different reasons. It could be that turmeric is just too broad. And then so they, they need to be more on like turmeric supplement or, or turmeric capsules versus like just turmeric maybe maybe the people that are searching just turmeric are actually looking for like the powder for like cooking or something like that. Gotcha. Um, All right. What other, what other tips and suggestions would you have to people listening in the audience in terms of you know, one of the, one of the top five things they should do? Yeah. It's, uh, I would say number four. Yeah. Going back to like the main image is really testing your main image. Um, and so really optimizing for click through rate, um, you know, pick is a phenomenal service out there, but you can grab, you know, two of your uh, biggest competitors uh, and then put your main image there and then just really keep optimizing with your design team until you're getting a higher click through rate than everyone else. Um, Yeah. We're looking for at least that we're taking 50% of the clicks that there's four options. You said, Uh, sometimes we'll, you said pick foo pick foo helps with that analyzing the images or analyzing click through rate versus your competitors. Uh, Good question. So they will let you kind of do like an online focus group in a sense where you grab, let's, um, you know, your a few of your competitors, main images, you kind of can assign prices you, and then you kind of randomize it and then you'll send people to vote and then they'll give you the results. And then oh. we're, um, we're wanting to basically have people choose at least like 50, us uh, 50% of the time where like, you know, normally you'd have 25% of the votes if there's, let's say four people, uh, four total options. Uh, but some of our, the listings that we'll create just do such a great job because of like the colors and the way it's merchandised. We sometimes see as high as they, you know, we'll get 75% of the clicks um, or like 75% of the votes. And so that's like what we're like, okay, this is going to be a home run. Like this, this totally is, is going to work. If that Excellent. makes sense. Yeah. So for those listening, it's pickfu.com and, uh, foo is spelled F U. So pick F U. Right. <laughs> dot com. Um, looks like you can sign up for a free trial, but what, what's the, is it a subscription service or a one-off service every time you use it? Uh, that's a good question. Yeah, truthfully, our, our team kind of manages that. Uh, and we have, we have some stuff in house that we use actually, um, over that. I, I was just going to, there's a membership to it. I just clicked it. I just, yeah. I, I guess I could have just clicked and not asked that question. So, <laughs> sorry about that. No, it's all good. Yeah. Um, all right. Yeah. No, getting, uh, you know, the biggest mistake I made when I actually had a supplement brand is that I always made the decision on what I thought was best for the customer in terms of images. I'm like, oh yeah, they're going to, they're going to like that image more. They're going to click through on that link more. That copy's mm-hmm. going to, you know, kill things. It's going to be amazing. And honestly, Fernando, I was always wrong, you know, and I, and I didn't know it until we started split testing, which, it looks like uh, PicFu does as well in terms of the images. So that's pretty cool stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and Amazon has experiments now too. So you can run experiments with your main image as well, uh, which is, is cool. And how do you, how uh, do you find that? Is it called Amazon Experiment experiments or what is it? Uh, yeah. It's within, yeah, within the seller central there's yeah Amazon experiments. And then, so uh, we'll, we'll kind of do the test first internally uh yeah. you know using that and then we'll we'll um we'll put it live on um, amazon experiments afterwards just to, to double check and then we have like a running list of internal experiments that we're running across our accounts and clients and then so we're kind of using that as kind of our standard of how we do things what are some of the best tools inside of seller central that most people don't use or don't know about there's got to be some great stuff that you know of that the common average seller is not using, or maybe I'm just dead wrong. Yeah, no, uh, I mean, I think we use a lot of the same 
the same ones. Uh, I mean, I, I do think the product opportunity explore is is really interesting. Uh, I the why I like it is just kind of it just kind of gives you a little bit of insight in terms of how Amazon like buckets um, specific keywords and then yeah how they're associating them. It, it shows. Um, yeah, like sales over like time, like, like I think the last 90 days, last like 360, um, 360 or 365 days. And it just kind of shows a, a ton of stuff. I, I, I mess around with that a lot. That's called Brand product, I, product opportunity explorer. Yep. Okay. All right. That one's more recent. Uh, brand analytics. I, I really love, um, I think that's the one that I probably spend the most time on. What does that do? It's give, um, it's cataloging the top 2.2 million keywords, uh, and then it ranks them in terms of relative um, search rank. And then, so basically, the number one keyword is at that point in time the number one searched item on all of Amazon. And then you can you you can drill down to specific weeks, specific months, or specific quarters. And then, so you can say like, oh, okay, you know, I want to sell whatever. Like Halloween products, and then so you can go back to October, like the first week of October last year, and then determine like, okay, what were the top selling Halloween items, and that way that you can kind of use that like for your analysis, and then for each of those keywords, it shows you the top three items that are based on click share, and then what percentage of the click share they're getting, and what percentage of the conversion share they're getting, and then that is incredibly helpful. Um, it also shows you where they're ranking organically. Um, and then so by, uh, by seeing where they're ranking organically, you can kind of see, okay, well, how much of their sales, again, going back to the branded versus unbranded, how much of their sales is people looking specifically for this brand or this item versus um, how much sales is coming from the unbranded keywords, which is uh, people just searching for whatever pet deodorizer spray, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, total sense. Just out of curiosity, when you do the brand uh, uh, keyword search, is that what you call it? Brand analytics, sorry. Mm -hmm. How often, how often is the word or the book, the Exopreneur's Playbook, right at the top of search? That's It's the number one search in Amazon at all times. <laughs> <laughs> Every day, it's weird. Every day? Year round. Yeah, it's, Every it's, day. It's, 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 it's never actually. So let's address that, folks. Um, my goal over the next 12 months is to give away 10,000 digital copies of the Expreneur's Playbook. I've always said I'm not going to make money selling books, um, but I wrote it so that you, the entrepreneur, will understand the real value of your business and get inside of my head and what I know and what the team at Quiet Light knows. I mean, we've helped people exit to the tune of a half a billion uh, dollars in transactions over the last decade. It's much more than that, actually, but it's a comfortable number to say. And so we're detailing in the book, or I'm detailing in the book, the different levers that you can push or pull to get more value, uh, how to actually calculate the value of your business. So if you're going to go ahead and sell on your own to a friend, neighbor, cousin, aunt, uncle, or Thrasio, you want to get the best understanding you can about what 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 the real calculation is for seller's discretionary earnings and all of the different potential ad decks. Like you've mentioned Helium 10 a few times, Fernando. Thrasio already has that and they've got other tools. So if you're an FBA business owner and you're selling to Thrasio or another aggregator, your Helium 10 or Jungle Scout subscription is an ad back because it's an expense that does not carry forward. That much more detail is in the book. Go to exitpreneur.io forward slash QLpod to download your free digital version of it. You can read it on your Kindle, your Nook, your iBook, whatever it might be. All right, Fernando, back to cool tools inside of Seller Central that other people or most people don't use. I wanna ask about one uh, more than anything else because a couple of years ago, I was working with a guy named Rob Green who owned a uh, pretty large supplement brand. You know Rob? I know Rob. Yeah, and it was when uh, Amazon's um, subscribe and save reports were just getting a little bit better and you're in the supplement business. How, how far have they come? And, and do you, do you think subscribe and save is something that everybody in the supplement space or anybody that has a recurring revenue product should use on Amazon? Um, yeah, I mean, we haven't been in the space that long, so like, you know, it hasn't been as long as we've you know been uh, selling on Amazon. So 
it's hard for me to speak to how far it's is truthfully come. But yeah, I mean, truthfully, the reporting's still not like great or as much as you would want. I mean, we always want better reporting from Amazon. I think that's like, you know, what every seller's kind of dream is. Uh, but I think in terms of like the importance of subscribe and save, I mean, it's huge, right? It, you know, creates more predictability in terms of your business, helps you forecast inventory and cash flow. But then also like, yeah, when you when you want to eventually sell, it makes it a, a, a more stable asset, right? And so you're more valuable if you have more recurring income um, because it's easier to transition to, to a new buyer. And so, um, yeah, I, I think it's, it's, it's really helpful. Also, there's a lot of theory out there that, um, yeah, like, it's like Amazon, the kind of folklore theory that, uh, that subscribe and save orders actually in, like really dramatically still improve your ranking because it's like always like a hundred percent conversion. And so, uh, because you're automatically getting like the order, um, you know, questionably with or without a session. And so, um, so that it actually really helps you rank as well. That sounds like total folklore, not true at all. Why would Amazon do that? It's, you know, anybody with subscribe and save is going to rank over anybody new that they have a much better product, but I suppose, I well, suppose I, because customers, customers keep, well, they're not even coming back. They're not even coming back. Why would it help with rankings? They're just having the product show up in, in their mailbox and it's not even a session on Amazon. It's just in the, in the back end of it, but that's going right. to help the organic rankings of the product is the folklore. Well, so I guess the, the way that you could see it in that where it makes sense is that on average, like the customer ends up spending this much money on this product. Like, so it's kind of like an LTV of like the, the product. And so if you can see, like, and I'm sure Amazon has this data, but is that like X percentage of these orders will move to subscribe and save or drive this much revenue over this like five year period on this specific SKU versus these other SKUs. And it's much, and it's like more likely that they're going to do or to subscribe and say because it has ten thousand reviews and that builds trust versus the guy with a hundred reviews. Then you could see where Amazon would justify wanting to index you higher for this product with the more reviews if it's going to lead to more future revenue for Amazon, right? Wow. So there's so many nuances and tricks and, and, and speculative things because Amazon's not kind enough to tell us exactly how the <laughs> algorithm and rankings work. They should just you know, be an open book, right? They're a publicly right. traded company. They should be, right? Maybe not. Maybe not. <laughs> uh, let's let's switch topics here. I know we didn't get to a total of five and, and I don't want to take, dig too deep on seller central tools that nobody uses. Um, one of the things that you apparently have done incredibly well is hire full-time people. Like you get a team of 75 remote workers. Um, what's your process for finding the great ones? That's That's, that's a lot of people. Yeah, it, it's an awesome question. I mean, yeah, honestly, it's the only way that you can scale, right? To to sell, um, to to managing like lots of clients, and especially these kind of like really fast growing um, clients that are you know overall pretty demanding. Uh, I, I would say like yeah, it starts from having like a great um, talent acquisition team. I think we really spend so much time. Uh, over the last, yeah, I guess eight years, really like refining our, or just like our overall hiring process. I think when you first kind of start out as a seller um, or like an entrepreneur, I think you're kind of, you're hiring these generalists typically and you're, you're very forgiving in terms of the people that you kind of bring in. It's like, oh, they're like, they're good and they're, they're saving me time. And so like, this is like overall win. But I think as you start like really seeing the difference between like, an A player, a B player, and a C player, like it just makes such a like vast difference in terms of like how much less I need to spend like training like a superstar versus like, you know, you're kind of like normal, like I guess whatever B player, if you will. And so, um, yeah, I mean, a lot of what we've done truthfully is just like internally, just like constantly like raising the bar of our staff uh, and like the expectation in terms of like what their performance will look like and just really having like direct conversations um, when people aren't meeting that standard. And so we're kind of just like 
coaching them up or, or coaching them out. But I think, yeah, one of the, one of the things that I actually just heard um, that Sheryl Sandberg said, the you know, COO of uh, Facebook that I really love is that like, she was saying that their, their company's progress is uh, tied like directly proportional to the amount of difficult conversations that they're willing to have. And so just like how open and direct is your culture in terms of saying like, Hey, you're not meeting my expectations. Like I, I let's work through this together and, and come up with a game plan so that you are able to meet these expectations. And if people don't want to do that, like that's fine. Then find someone that that's able to, but I think that's been like, some of the, the more like transformational stuff that we've done recently. Very cool. We, we actually measure our success based on the number of conversations we had, very similar to what uh, the CEO said, Cheryl Steinberg. Um, where do you find them though, right? I've had um, uh, John Jonas from uh, um, onlinejobs.ph on the podcast. Mm -hmm. uh, we've used different uh, agencies. Um, and this is mostly for uh, remote VAs, foreign VAs. We've used an agency for an internal, uh, well, internal for US-based VA. Um, and eventually, with the agencies, I've the, the you know we've we've ended up hiring them direct and bringing them in house direct. But how do you? Where do you go? Is it at this point you've got seventy five people and it's just their cousin and aunt and uncle, or you know how do how do you? How, do you, how did you start? How do you, what do you recommend if, if I'm a newbie and I need some VAs? Yeah, that's a good question. I think when we first started, yeah, we did a lot of online jobs. <laughs> yeah, cousin, uncle, uh, you know, all, all that kind of stuff. I think as we've expanded, yeah, we don't use online jobs at all anymore. And so now it's more like LinkedIn, um, yeah, just employ branding, like, you know, actual like applications coming in. Uh, but yeah, I think what we really just try uh, to do is actually like a lot of like LinkedIn stalking, to be honest, like, you know, just really finding someone with the right background that's coming from a specific company that has the skill set, has already achieved what we're trying to do in that specific function. And then, um, and then finding someone with that exact like profile and pedigree. Wow. Cool. Any, uh, we're just running out of time here. Any last minute tips or advice or suggestions you've got for people out there trying to grow their Amazon businesses? No, I mean, I think now is the best time it's going to be, right? Uh, Today is always like the best day and then the next one's tomorrow. And so, yeah, I, I would just get started um, if you haven't already. Um, but yeah, it, it's an amazing space, such a cool community within the yeah the online like um space and so yeah feel free to reach out if you have any questions and how do they do that how do they connect with you uh yeah so yeah i'm, I'm really active on linkedin uh, but then also you can reach out to me at fernando at marketplaceops.com and i'll try to get back to you all right we'll put those in the show links as well folks fernando thanks for your time man good chatting good catch up yeah thanks so much